Hey, what's up? I'm Channel Pup Fanboy Supervillain, and the first of the three episodes of Sonic X Shadow Generations Dark Beginnings is finally, finally here. After what felt like forever extended edition, we finally have that first part, and I'm gonna be reviewing it today. Subscribe if you haven't already, and if you wanna become my boss, the link to my Patreon is in the description below. Hugely appreciated, thank you very much. So it's seemingly become a tradition now that alongside major releases, Sega will be releasing short films. And in a lot of ways, these have become just as exciting as the games themselves. These animations are home to some of the best quality work in the Sonic franchise. They've recruited some incredible collaborators to work on these animations, delivering shorts that really do belong on the world stage of animated shorts. Shorts like Knuckles' Divergence and Sonic Superstar's Trio of Trouble are amazing. So I really hope hope that Sega never stop this trend of releasing supplementary short films. These projects have even helped nurture brand new talent, such as Tyson Hess who is now working on the Sonic movies. But he got his start with the Sonic Mania animations. So I really hope that everyone involved in the creative process behind these animations go on to have fantastic careers. So I gotta start off with a little whinging. I gotta bitch a little just to get it out of the way. We're gonna start off with the one and really only negative that I have for this. Sega needs to get better with the release rollouts. And what I mean by this is at the end of the Sonic X Shadow Generations Dark Beginnings teaser that we got at Sonic Central, it said the film would drop on the 25th of September. Now, people from all around the world will have tuned in to that Sonic Central. So when I see the 25th of September, I, I don't expect the 26th of September at 1 a.m. I live in England and for everywhere east of here, it's going to be the 26th of September. Americans get it in the evening of the 25th of September, but the majority of the world get it at stupid o'clock on the 26th, and I don't understand how that's fair. Surely the Americans could have it at like lunchtime, and then we get it in the evening. So th that would just make so much more sense. That way, at least for the majority of the world, it would still be the 25th of September. Better yet, put a few more dates on there, or a time just so we can know when to expect this. I saw other YouTubers doing live streams in anticipation of it that were waiting hours before the film actually came out. And it's been the exact same with things like the Sonic Frontiers DLC as well. It's announced that it will be out on a certain date, and then it's actually out the next day, but at 1 a.m. I understand the majority of the market is in the USA. I understand that time zones are a pickle, but there's gotta be a way of releasing this without giving a massive middle finger to everyone east of the USA. Same goes for toy sales as well. Why are the deluxe action figures USA exclusive? Why are the new IDW comic series action figures USA exclusive? I didn't choose to be born in England, okay? Get good. All right, with that little rant out of the way though, let's talk about Sonic X Shadow Generations Dark Beginning. Innings. Episode 1, Shadow and Maria. So immediately, any long-term fans of Shadow or Sonic are going to be instantly hit with unease, as it opens with POV shots of Shadow and Maria running hand-in-hand hand through a corridor. This mirroring the iconic POV shot leading to Maria's death in Sonic Adventure 2, before it's revealed that this isn't that scene. It's revealed that Maria is really just running because she's excited to show Shadow the Aurora Borealis, but she's overexerted herself. And this is the first time we've really seen the effects of Maria's illness portrayed, her weakened state. You can see that she is quite seriously unwell, but her excitement also asserts that Maria is an innocent child dealing with this illness. It shows that she clearly wants to overcome this illness. And you can see how this weighs heavy on Shadow as well. He feels that it's his purpose to cure Maria, but he doesn't know how or what to do, and you can see how much this frustrates him, but ultimately, Maria just values him as a friend. Immediately, the relationship between Shadow and Maria feels the most tender that it has been in any piece of official Sonic media. Other, like, fan projects have done a really nice job with this. There's my buddy Salty DK Dan's Shadow and Maria comic that he wrote that I actually think handles this a bit better than the manga did. That being said, I am basing that off of a very literal translation of the Korokoro manga, but I think Salty handled that story with a lot more 
more humanity and portrayed Shadow and Maria's friendship in a much more heartfelt way. There is also the Project Shadow fan film, which I absolutely must talk about someday. We'll probably talk about it more in the run-up to the Sonic 3 movie, but that fan film also did an amazing job with the dynamic between Maria and Shadow, so it is nice to finally see official media catching up with that. Abruptly, Emil busts out of the experimental weapons wing, which really paints a picture of how this sick young girl was effectively growing up in an advanced military operation, where she was in danger just about every day of her life. There are signs that things aren't quite right though, as Shadow envisages the gun soldiers about to kill Maria before he shakes it off and springs into action to rescue Professor Gerald from Emerle. Now, if you were looking forward to this as the big return of Emerle, it's not really that. Emerle is here in service of Shadow. He doesn't get a huge deal of screen time in this. However, it's not like he's wasted. They do use his ability to mimic his opponents. That is in the fight choreography, which is incredible, by the way. And while it isn't lampshaded in the way that it was in, say, Sonic X, that ability to mimic his opponents is absolutely there. It's pretty subtle, but, like, for one example, he rolls into a spin ball a mere second after Shadow does. If anything, not lampshading, it makes this process appear much quicker and more formidable. It is cool just to see Emerle here, though. And he serves a really good purpose in this story, even if he isn't on screen much. That being that Emerle's assault on the Ark is just one of many of Shadow's traumatic memories playing in the wrong order. Shadow delivers a blow that shatters the entire scene into glass, and he finds himself in the gun siege of the Space Colony arc once again, remembering and realizing that things aren't quite right here. He finds himself tumbling into Gerald Robotnik's cell where Gerald is executed by the firing squad. As Shadow runs towards the Professor, he seemingly finds himself further and further away until he's in a crimson nightmare world reminiscent of the clouds of Black Doom. He has traumatic memories playing out in the lightning of the clouds, including the death of Maria Robotnik, who appears to be shot through the heart, and the gun soldiers are to blame, truly giving love a bad name. And these images in the lightning are beautifully composed. Shadow quickly snaps out of it on a cliffside. Everything was just a vision of his past. And then looking beyond the destroyed moon, which is once again destroyed. It's, it's not all better this time. I guess all those other times are just facing in the other direction. Beyond the ruins of the moon, the Ark is calling to him as he wonders if Professor Gerald may have survived. And so Shadow heads off into the night in search of answers. And that concludes our very first episode. And the credits have gameplay of Sonic X Shadow Generations playing with a really chill track. Kind of gives off vibes of loneliness and isolation while also just being kind of a bop. Suits Shadow perfectly. So this whole thing was kind of a little bit like Shadow experiencing the Mysterio nightmare from Spider-Man Far From Home, which naturally I'm on board with that. You've got that kind of questioning what's real, what isn't, why certain memories are interrupting other ones that are supposed to have occurred before that, before it busts into that psychedelic nightmare. I love that kind of stuff. Keeps you guessing for a little bit before going all in on the psychedelia. They are really leaning into this being an anime as well in terms of like the Japanese influence, such as like the Japanese subtitles whenever like uh, something that says like the present day or something comes up on screen, which is great. While other Sonic shorts have been a bit more Saturday morning cartoon inspired, this one is more anime inspired and it's being very upfront with that. The animation this time is a bit different to previous Sonic animations that we've had. Unlike Knuckles Divergence or Trio of Trouble, this isn't handled by powerhouse animation this time, nor is it hand-drawn. It is instead 3D animation by Studio Gigex. But it's sort of that 3D anime style. More like, say, Dragon Ball Superhero. And it is put to effective use here. The action is incredibly dynamic, especially that fight choreography between Shadow and Emerle. But it's also just nice to really see, like, Shadow's life aboard the Ark play out with such a cinematic quality. Once again, in an official piece of media, I think fan media has done an amazing job with that. Once again, Project Shadow is the first thing that springs to mind. Because look, like, in Sonic Adventure, you'd have, like, that cutscene of, like, Maria and Shadow, and they're talking about the world below and what it'd be like to live there, and Earth just looks like a PNG piece of garbage. Yet here they're watching over it, there's the Northern 
and lights, you can see it beneath the transparent kind of glass floor. And because the design of the Ark is kind of as open as it is, it means the Earth can create a really nice atmosphere. And it's quite literally coming from below, as, yeah, the light of the Aurora Borealis shines through the flooring of the Space Colony Ark. So a really ingenious piece of set design there. And when Emil attacks and everything's blowing up, it looks like a hellscape. When Shadow runs along the corridors, how they seem to kind of stretch endlessly and get darker and darker, because what he's facing is some of the darkest chapters of his life. Also the lighting when he's in Professor Gerald's cell, when the light is swinging backwards and forwards. The colors are very muted, but like the blacks are just kind of slightly off black. They're slightly grayish, creating this very kind of dusty look to it. There is a really oppressive atmosphere to this short, and I think they did an amazing job with that. And that same also carries over to the sound design as well. I mentioned when I did a breakdown of the clip, how like you really do hear the sound of like Maria stroking Shadow's snoot. You can hear how kind of textured that is, the sound of the lamps swinging backwards and forwards, the sounds of the thunder when Shadow's in the nightmare world. The voice acting as well is great. Stephanie Shea as Maria Robotnik does a wonderful job. She really sells the innocence and the excitement of Maria as she sees the Aurora Borealis, the friendship and tenderness she feels towards Shadow, and the fear she feels towards Emil. I think this is the most that any official Maria Robotnik voice actor has ever gotten to do, and she absolutely nails it. And then there's Kirk Thornton as Shadow. And I've always been a believer in Kirk Thornton as Shadow. I can understand why people might be skeptical. When Kirk Thornton and the Studiopolis cast were first brought onto the Sonic games, it was at a time when Sega were kind of rethinking these characters, simplifying them, and with that, Shadow became more kind of this sleazy loner than the Shadow the Hedgehog we know and love, and Kirk Thornton's voice matched that really well. Look at Sonic Freeriders. Shadow is portrayed as a total sleazeball, and Kirk Thornton does an excellent job with that. If you don't believe me, let's go again. This victory will be in honor of our fallen comrade. At the same time though, we act like Sonic Forces didn't happen. Well, only in this context anyway. Sonic Forces, for all of its faults, did right by Shadow, and Kirk Thornton was amazing as Shadow in that game. I kind of forgot that it was like, yeah, this is a fairly new Shadow voice actor, it just sounds like Shadow the Hedgehog to me. Worthless. Don't show your pathetic face around me ever again. He didn't get a huge amount to do there, but he was definitely better in that game than he was in others. Now we're at a stage where they're actively embracing the lore and history of this franchise. <laughs> Unless it's the Archie or Fleetway comics, am I right? And now Shadow is back to being himself, and we're getting to hear Kirk Thornton do a proper Shadow performance. And I had no doubt he'd nail it. So I am as happy to be unsurprised as ever here when I say that, yeah, Kirk Thornton did an excellent job as Shadow here. The low gravity here only keeps your condition in remission. You should know better than to exert yourself. The soldiers, they storm the Ark, destroy all evidence, but it's too soon. It's happening too quickly. His interactions with Maria make him feel kind of like a, an uncle-like figure to Maria. There's definitely a sense that he's a bit more mature and he's got a duty of care over her. And he kind of sells Shadow's sense of discontent with himself, the fact that he's been unable to cure Maria. I think Shadow's dialogue in this short as well does a lot to kind of recontextualize this sort of modern vision of who Shadow is. He kind of confesses to Maria that he's not sure that he really has a place on Earth. Now, I have been quite critical with how Shadow as a character has been kind of treated, how in interviews surrounding this game and uh, discussions of, say, the Sonic mandates, it's kind of been made clear that Shadow isn't really allowed to have friendships in the conventional sense. He's not really allowed to have that warmth. He might occasionally have alliances with Sonic and the gang, but he doesn't hold them in any kind of positive regard or fondness. Which is still not something I really like, but I will say that this line of dialogue where he says he's not sure if he has a place down there, and how kind of he feels like he was born with the purpose to cure Maria Robotnik, kind of does a bit more to justify this lack of humanity. The thing is, it makes him very endearing. It makes me want for him to be able to find a place on Earth. It makes me want him to be able to have a little life of his own. So I am still hoping that we will get to that point for Shadow's sake, but if it's something they want to explore, and kind of bring attention to that Shadow doesn't really feel like he has a place with other people on Earth. And maybe that's because of how he was genetically engineered. He just he doesn't know how to navigate that. 
that does open the door for some really cool stories that I hope they will actually explore. That don't have to necessarily blossom into a fully blown friendship between him and Sonic, but can at least hint at a little bit of warmth there. Either way, while I disagree with that direction for the character in the future, if this is how it's going to be handled, I think this is the best way you can possibly do it, and it is leading into a really cool story here. The music is also great here. While it is kind of the full orchestral, which I do want more kind of Sonic movie projects to move away from, it does do a nice job at accenting the tragedy and horrors of these scenes, with some memorable leitmotifs in there as well. But the biggest thing I want to talk about here is the death of Maria Robotnik and how that is handled in this short. The death of Maria Robotnik has been a bit of an in-joke among Sonic fans for quite some time now. I remember on an old episode of the Sunset City podcast, myself and Gilly the Kid hooting with laughter at the fact that Maria Robotnik gets iced in a Sonic game. I will always advocate for Sonic to go above and beyond just being this rubber hose little rodent and telling stories that tap into serious subject matter. But it has always been kind of funny seeing these little low poly hedgehog critters talking about a little girl getting iced because it's just so extreme. And in an official capacity, we've only really ever before this scratched the surface of that idea. But when I think of the death of Maria Robotnik, I tend to think about myself and my friends hooting with laughter about just how extreme that is. The joke cap that kid hashtag and people cheering at Maria Robotnik's death at the Sonic symphonies. And what is absolutely wild about Sonic X Shadow Generation's Dark Beginnings is that it presents all of that without a shred of irony and I didn't laugh at all. I didn't even smirk or smile or anything. I genuinely found myself fully invested in this tragedy. Now, don't get me wrong. When I play Sonic Adventure 2, I'm fully invested in that story, but there's always that slight layer of irony to Maria Robotnik's death. It's not something that breaks your heart. You just feel kind of bad for Shadow, and it helps kind of sell his motivations for that game, but it is really funny to actually think about. Here, though, this isn't a low-poly hedgehog that wants to destroy the world because his friend Kid got capped. Here, we actually get to see what said Kid was actually like and what she was dealing with. How she had hope for her survival, but also just viewed Shadow as a friend and never expected him to be the one to cure her. How the idea of heading to Earth excited her. These are all things that have been touched on before, but this short really goes a long way to actually sell that. I actually felt emotional when I saw Maria Robotnik collapse. I actually felt emotional when it was implied that she was shot in the fucking heart. Not once in those scenes did I ever think about people cheering at the Sonic Symphony or this thing that's just been an in-joke among among Sonic fans for decades. It was presented without a shred of irony, and it absolutely landed, and I could not respect this project more, knowing that this actually really nailed that plot point. They could have toned it down, they could have been a bit more tongue-in-cheek, but this project sold me on Shadow's trauma. Maybe that's why I've taken issue with Shadow being quite as emotionally stunted as he's been in the recent years, is because I was just never sold on his trauma until now. But if this is the direction they're going and this is the justification, hats off to them, they made it work. This short has done absolute wonders for the character of Shadow already, and I think this is going to be a really pivotal year for this character. I can't wait to see where things go next. I think in the next episode, we're set to meet Team Dark. I cannot stress enough how excited I am to see Shadow interacting with Rouge and Omega again. This short was truly amazing. Genuinely, truly amazing. This is the kind of stuff that should be seen by people around the world. This is the kind of stuff that should be viewable to the mainstream. Not the Knuckles TV series that couldn't take anything seriously and had to have Knuckles be second fiddle to American comedians. This here that sells Sonic mythology with sincerity and passion. This is proper, true, raw Sonic media right here. This is what this franchise is all about. Never turn back, Shadow. What do you folks think? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you've enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is the link to my Patreon page, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos, with a special shout out going to the patrons in the $5 and above tier. They they are Cho Henshin, KB, RT0, Cal X, Hypes, Sad Goku, Dare Denny, SSS06, Kale Bennett, Ken K, Mr. SP, Cirrus the Skeptic, Biotin, 
Oh no, I've used up all of the helium. What am I meant to do now? And Vera Wild. Thank you, good folks, so much for your generosity. And to those of you at home, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Now get out of here.